Um, good day, welcome, one and all. Um, thank you all for joining us today. This is our third webinar in the Changing Landscape series. Um, we're here today to talk about art, uh, why we love it, how it inspires us, and how it works in public places. Um, do feel free to leave some questions and answer questions on the Q&A function um, on the screen so we can actually discuss those at the end. Um, and on that note, I'm going to hand over to Marcus Fairs, who is uh, founder and editor-in-chief of Design, and quite, quite rightly one of the most influential design websites in the world. So over to you, Marcus. Thanks, David. And hi, everyone. Welcome to our Election Day special, where we'll be trying our best to distract you from what's going on <laughs> in America right now and talk about really important things like arts in the public realm. We have um, four speakers today. We have David, who we've, who's just very kindly introduced me. David, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you and what you do, just in case people don't know? Um, oof, a very checkered career, but for the last nearly 30 years, I've been producing sundial sculptures, water features out of our workshops in Oxfordshire. Um, we've just won our second Queen's Award for Export, which I find staggering, but um, we are uh, punching above our weight. We have about 30 people, but we, we are selling all over the world um, some fairly substantial sculptures now, which uh, the logistics of getting them to site and, and built is more, than, more of a problem than actually making them in our workshops. And, and what percentage of your artworks would you say are for the public realm as compared to people's private gardens and houses and so on? I would say about half. Um, I mean, they certainly represent that the work is, is more substantial, the public pieces. Um, there's a piece we're just about to send off to Florida. There's a piece actually on the ocean as we speak, heading to Denver, um, uh, courtesy of Nine Dot Arts. But the, yes, the, a lot of it is public and it requires a very different um, mindset. You know, it's for a much broader um, viewing public than you can get the measure of the individual if you're selling to a private client, but you've got to make it a, a, have a much broader appeal um, and certainly be more robust. And we'll find out in just a few minutes why you have a, a piece on a ship heading for Denver. Um, but first of all, I'd like to bring in Rowena Hall, who's um, partner and chief operating officer at Argent, which is a very high profile property development company here in London. Hi, Rowena. Hello. So tell us a little bit, bit about yourself and the work you do with Argent and also what Argent is. Um, so Argent is a um, large regeneration uh, developer. We have done work in Birmingham, Manchester and London in the UK, probably best known recently for all our work at King's Cross, uh, which we've been working on since about 2000. So no quick gratification in, uh, in development. Um, and we are working on other projects around London too. And um, I think the, the really passionate um, aspects about our um, regeneration projects is actually um, that we really do focus on the public realm first and layer on the arts, uh, culture and enlivenment. And we can talk a bit about what that means um, in this session. Absolutely. And but just for people who, who aren't familiar with London and with King's Cross, I mean, King's Cross, it's, it's a private development, isn't it? It's a huge private development on former railway lands, but a large part of it is open to the public. There are squares, yeah. there are pedestrianised streets. So, so what is it about private development that has led you to giving over so much pet space for people to just wander, wander into and use for free? Yeah, so we're about 40% public realm over 67 acres. Um, and the really important thing for us is that actually people should not understand or, or sort of um, appreciate when they're actually kind of entering our um, area of regeneration. Um, and it feels absolutely connected and one with the rest of the city. Um, we feel so passionately about the public realm. That's why we often deliver it first, actually, before we deliver the buildings, because it's the public realm that actually defines and creates a place for us. And obviously that's then where the buildings sit, um, sit amongst it. So we have a mixture of gardens, um, parks, squares, playgrounds, um, and we try and create a variety of spaces for all types of people, not only the people that are living and working, 
um, around King's Cross, but actually for visitors to enjoy from London and from wider. And how does public art fit into this amongst the, you know, the piazzas and the buildings and the parks and the, the planting? What about public art? So we, uh, we absolutely take it sort of from a layered uh, approach. Um, arts is a really fundamental part alongside um, culture and events. We have large events programs as well. Um, we can talk a bit about it in more detail and I'll show you some visuals, but actually we've had a real um, phased approach to art in our public realm. The first phase is absolute, was around um, setting out markers and um, setting out a sort of milestones around the site so that people got to know what was going on. And we really celebrated the temporary as the regeneration was happening. Then we moved into a sort of second phase, which was more about um, starting to have more human scale um, pieces that people could actually interact with as we were finishing off parts of the site. Um, and we're now sort of moving more into our third phase which is um, more around um, starting to actually form a collection and more permanent pieces um, around, our, um, around our public spaces. And that's all alongside events programmes that we hold, which supplement um, and engage with those art pieces. Okay, thanks, Moira. And as you said, we'll be looking at a few images of what you've been working on in a minute, just after we've introduced our final participants, who are Martha Weidman and Molly Casey of Denver-based art consultancy, Nine dot arts. Hi, Martha and Molly. Hello. Hello. Now, I think I think we just figured out the connection between you and David because it sounds like <laughs> you bought or ordered one of his pieces. But tell us a little bit about yourselves first of all and your organisation. Well, Nine Dot Arts is a corporate art consultancy. We're based here in the U.S., but we work with artists all over the world. So we focus on creative placemaking and bringing spaces to life through artwork. And it's really nice to be here this morning to talk about art on November 4th, of course, uh, with everything going on in our country with the election. So very happy for this distraction and to talk about how art can really make a difference in the experience in people's everyday lives. We work in projects that ranging from, you know, multi-acre, large-scale development, uh, that are entire neighborhoods doing public art planning, public art placemaking, all the way down to boutique hotels who might be looking for a local arts program to highlight the creativity of their region. So uh, thank you for having us here today and uh, look forward to speaking more about the project that we're working on with David. And I'll pass that to Molly. I'll just go ahead and chime in real quickly that we were able to work with David and are still working with David right now. Our, our sculptures are on a boat coming over um, to be installed this coming um, winter and into the spring, depending on how the earth thaws out here. Um, so yeah, we, we worked with David um, specifically for a huge commission here for the Denver Water Campus that's been completely redone and built um, right near downtown Denver. And uh, we invited David to participate in an artist um, call for entry. And he won not only one, but two of the sites yeah. out of the three. So um, he, he created work that was just so specific to the project and really hit home for them, but also was gonna be enjoyed by um, the public here in Denver as well. So we're looking forward to getting that piece here. When's it due? It's probably two thirds of the way across the Atlantic at the moment. So it'll then spend a bit of time on a train. It should be with them. I think it's meant to be with you in about another 10 days. I'm, I'm yes, I believe so. I believe um, so. And then, then there's the massive issue as to how we install it. Because I'm <laughs> currently not allowed to go into the States for any reason. I mean, no, yes. has, not just me. I'm, you know. <laughs> No, I think we'll be doing a lot of FaceTiming and Zoom calls, but we have a fantastic installer here who knows how to do that, so. Okay, well, it's a nice Thanksgiving gift for you anyway when it arrives <laughs> on your doorstep. Anyway, just to give a bit of a context of all the panelists and what they do, we've prepared a little presentation with a few images from each speaker. Do you want to fire that up, David, and you start off because the first images are yours? Yes. So um, this is a relatively recent piece, but it's, um, it's, it's cast bronze. It weighs about two and a half tons. 
and the central uh, orb is uh, gold leafed spikes. Um, it's actually that's in Dubai, and I put I placed that particular piece there because it was the juxtaposition really with all the the hard, linear, clever architecture, and it attracted an enormous amount of attention. And 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 the gold orb in the middle catches the light. It was slightly inspired by some kind of marine shape, shell like, and um, and it's almost like a sea urchin in the middle. But it was really the um, the contrast with the, the 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 lines of the architecture and it is now sitting happily uh, in dubai being admired by many the other piece uh, the next piece is the is this was the brief for this was architecture the client had just built an enormous um, shopping facility in qatar and they were obsessed with architecture they were very proud of their architecture and so i took the principle of the keystone at the top of any um, arch and then we just mirrored it round in an implausible impossible way and that's I think it's about 15 feet tall and it was meant to be a focal point and it's bronze it was again a nice it's a, pl a placemaker and a meeting point it's about a it's for the public to see engage children were clambering all over it before we'd even finished installing it so it's doing its job <laughs> I think there's another couple of slides. The the next one with the children drinking from, that was the first drinking fountain commissioned by the Royal Parks in 30 years. It was designed specifically so you could fill your drinking bottles from it so we're not buying plastic bottles. And it was actually commissioned and paid for by um, Michael Freeman from Argent. Um, there's another link. Um, and the Freeman Foundation and it's a great success because it was the bronze petals were mirroring the trees above and the reflective stainless quality reflected the, the park around it. The last one, there's a sort of spherical trend here, was a um, uh, the ginkgo mantle that's in Chengdu in China. It's actually very, it's much larger than it looks. It's probably about, again, 10, 12 feet. And they are individual cut, uh, ginkgo leaves all welted together in a very delicate lattice. So um, a, a nod to the importance of the ginkgo in China. Um, again, climbed all over within minutes of us installing it. So I get fulfilling many functions, one being decorative and two as a children's climbing frame, which most of the things seem to end up doing, which is good. <laughs> and quickly, David, do you fabricate all of your pieces in England and in, then ship them or do you sometimes manufacture them put them together on location? We, we, we make them in England and the, we have a project just about to leave to go to Florida which we can't act we've just had we just built an enormous new workshop with um, a, what seems to be a, a vast door and the first piece we built in it is too big to come out the door I mean it's been designed to be dismantled and put in a container and shipped but it is uh, yes, that's one of the few ones we're actually assembling on site. Everything's made in Oxfordshire and that we've got a fantastic team of about, well, there's at least 20 people creating and, a, and another 10 or so people organising. And I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just doing the bits in between. <laughs> Thanks, David. And now, uh, Morwenna, there's a few images explaining your work with Argent coming up. Yeah, so I think the, the first thing to say is I don't personally uh, profess, and neither obviously do uh, my development um, company profess to be um, sort of art critics or art curators ourselves. So um, one of the key things that we do is we do work with um, curators and art, arts panels to help um, advise um, us. And that's a really, you know, obviously pleasurable experience. Um, personally, I've worked with Argent now for about um, eight years. I'm an engineer um, by background, but I do absolutely see the, the beauty in things. And I've been really privileged to work on a couple of um, architectural projects, not really arts projects, but architectural projects on, on King's Cross, which have, um, I'd say, probably been unusual and delightful, um, which obviously, um, you know, sits well alongside arts projects as well. So the first one here is Gasholder 8. Um, so I had the 
the pleasure of putting up a gas holder structure um, first time in about 150 years probably anyone was actually pulling them up as opposed to taking them down and designed um, this public park inside with Bell Phillips architects and it's a um, beautiful um, mirror finished canopy structure um, which plays with um, views um, to do kind of blocking the buildings when you go one direction and opening out to the canal on the other side and it's really interesting how this is chimed with social media and actually um, it's also the same with my second um, project, if you just want to move along the slide. Um, so I worked for about seven years on um, Cold Drops Yard, which is a retail um, destination within King's Cross. Obviously, retail is going through a very tough time, so quite an um, interesting time to have launched a new um, shopping destination in London. But what I loved about this project, it was a, a mixture of, of um, creating amazing um, space with some lovely um, old Victorian buildings working with Heatherwick Studio but also creating some really interesting um, public space and you can see from here that actually we're having great fun um, using those space and, and dressing it in different ways and having other in, you know engaging activities um, and installations uh, for the public to enjoy and we can a bit more about that so um, if you go on to the next slide please um, as I said before we've kind of we've got really three phases of the history of King's Cross. The first phase here you can see we, we did some quite large-scale projects. Um, the IFO uh, birdcage on the left, a, um, a project with Verini which was absolutely fantastic on the heritage buildings and we also built a large pond which um, not many people would necessarily have, have considered to be art. These were projects that, as I said before really helped define um, King's Cross and, and get people to understand the various um, kind of existing buildings um, around the site. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the second phase um, are definitely projects more of a human scale. We have um, been creating artwork within the public space um, and also within our buildings. Um, most of this is still temporary in nature. So as the regeneration project is evolving, um, these projects um, are coming, enhancing people's experience of the space um, and then, um, and then next slide, please. Um, and what we're starting to do now is um, actually create some more permanent um, works within the public realm. And actually, now that we're nearly built out at King's Cross, it's an opportunity to understand how people are using the space and respond accordingly, as opposed to having some sort of preconceived ideas beforehand. Not, not the public don't always behave as you necessarily um, anticipate they may. Um, and this is one of our first permanent um, works. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please, with Eva Rothschild. Um, we're actually building a building behind, which is why this is still a CGI, but this is an exciting moment for us to um, have this image come to life over the next uh, year or two. Thanks, uh, Maureen. Sorry, you finished. Oh, sorry. Uh, nearly, just to say that we're getting a bit famous for our uh, non-traditional um, Christmas trees, and we can talk a bit about um, that is always a really exciting um, project each year to, to select an artist and, and collaborate and work with them. And then next slide, please. Um, and just to say that we have been busier than ever during the pandemic, which I think is interesting and will come up as a bit of a discussion point later in, in this. Um, in this. And um, quickly, before we go on to Martha and Molly, Morwenna, um, do you to any extent consider the buildings to be part of the public art program because you showed us the Thomas Heatherwick Cold Drops mm -hmm. Yard there and then there's the, the, the amazing Aga Khan Centre. I mean some of the buildings are pretty spectacular aren't they? Do you think of them as a, as a, a gift to the public realm on the same level as art pieces? Yeah I, in some respects I think we do. Obviously the architecture, architecture has a that it needs to provide um, but we still try and approach it to enhance and delight um, and give you know the best overall experience for the users and for um, people visiting um, and what we do then is try and layer um, layer on sort of the more um, interactive pieces etc in the in the public realm um, what is um, quite interesting though is that we have the opportunities as the plots are being developed to actually use the perimeters of the plots for artwork. So actually one of, one of the ways that we 
um, engage most with the public whilst we're building is through the public hoarding. Um, and that's a great sort of canvas, if you like, um, for us to work with. And so we have identified quite a few artists and worked with them on, on collaborations on our hoarding designs. Brilliant. Thanks very much. And finally, Martha and Molly, if you could show us, talk us through your image sets. Oh, yes. So um, just quickly uh, about the role of what Nine.Arts does and how we're involved in these projects. So I think uh, the best way to explain that is through the name of, of our company. So the name Nine.Arts comes from the brain teaser puzzle of nine dots in a grid shape. It can only be solved using four straight lines and you have to connect all nine of the dots with four straight lines. And the only way to solve the puzzle is to think outside the box. So the way that uh, we're brought in, usually we're here to support the developers, uh, to support the building owners or the project owners, and to help them develop a vision for what the art experience will be like. And then we take that vision and we go out into the world to find the right artists to help bring that to life. So for example, uh, you know, we might come up with a very creative solution and then we'll work with engineering teams and an engineer like, like Morwena to kind of uh, keep all of those creative ideas uh, structurally sound and put together. And then we'll find an artist like David uh, whose work and whose brand really tie in with the narrative of the project. So Molly Casey, our chief curator is here and I'll let her run through some of the slides and tell a bit about the story and the narrative with each one and how those artists brought those projects to life. Great, thanks Martha. And just as a heads up, it is what, 822 here in Denver and my children are getting ready to go to school. So you may hear some little voices in the background. I uh, love working from home in an open concept house. It's really exciting. Um, so to start off, we, this is a project we worked on about 11 years ago, the Rocky Mountain Hospital for Children in Denver. And this is a hospital completely dedicated to the health care of children. And so it was really important to have artwork, every, everything that, um, that either the children could touch or could be tactile, things that were made out of different materials, um, really different pieces that could delight and distract from what they were going through at the hospital. And it was really fun because we got to partner too with the art therapist who worked at the hospital and make sure that a lot of the artwork was stuff that the um, children could actually recreate themselves so that they could take them on tours through the different parts of the hospital get influenced and inspired by an art piece and then take that back to their room and create something of their own. We can go to the next one. So the Blue Trees, uh, this was a project that we did a, a couple of years ago here in downtown Denver um, with Constantine Demopoulos. And this is a project that he's done around the world, um, but it was the first time that it had been brought to Denver. And it, it's really, um, it's a community-based project. So this was really a placemaking opportunity, but also um, it was a chance for our community to all come together and participate in creating artwork. Uh, pre-COVID times, obviously. So we took over um, 14 blocks of downtown Denver, and for an entire month, we all helped Constantine um, paint and color um, over 130 trees downtown. And with this brilliant blue um, paint that is completely safe for the trees, as a caveat here, this is, uh, it washes off and it's totally safe. Um, but it's really to bring attention to trees in our urban landscape and how important trees are in general. Sorry, school time. And um, just to bring attention to deforestation. Um, and so we actually partnered not only with Constantine, we had several schools come out and help as well. And so he brought in all these different communities together. And we also had um, at the end a culmination of family tree painting day where um, another like 200 saplings were brought in to a central park here. And people, everybody, the whole public was invited to come and paint a sapling. And then those trees were distributed throughout the city of Denver and planted. So you might see the trees downtown, but if for some reason you didn't get a chance to see them, you might be walking down the street in your neighborhood and a blue tree would just pop up in front of you. And because of our dry climate here in Denver, um, the paint is still on some of the trees. So I'm always delighted when I see a couple of blue trees still around. 
uh, town since it doesn't rain nearly as much <laughs> as it does in these other places, but Constantine has done this work. Uh, so this is a, a private organization um, based out of Lansing, Michigan, and they've, we've actually done projects for Jackson National Life all over um, the United States. Um, and they really, they are an investment firm and also um, an insurance firm. And they wanted to make sure to bring in um, the natural landscape of Michigan and the surrounding forest. They've built this new campus within the woods. And one of the most popular trees in Michigan is a willow tree. And so we partnered um, with artist Katie Stone. Uh, she's a, a sculptor and uh, works out of her Seattle uh, studio. And she created this three-dimensional um, piece completely laser cut from aluminum and then hand painted. And it's, it's a little hard to tell here, but each one of these pieces is installed individually and they're all different um, depths off of the wall. So it creates this beautiful shadow effect as well, um, but really taking over this massive space um, in their new conference center. The Dairy Block Alley here in Denver, which has become very popular as a place to go, um, and this, it, we did an entire placemaking um, activity here where the entire alley, it had to, it had to transform. We have an alley in downtown Denver and typically you're discouraged your whole life from going down dark alleys. It's not a thing that makes you feel safe or a place that you necessarily want to play in because it's usually a little smelly and dark. So we had to do something to activate this alley and get people to want to come down the alley. And so artwork is the perfect catalyst to be able to do that. So we worked with local artists primarily here in Colorado, but also a few international artists that came um, for our annual event called Crush, which is a mural, um, two weeks of mural painting uh, just outside of Denver or of downtown Denver in an arts district called the River North. And it brings international talent to Denver and just, it's, it's an amazing event. And so we piggybacked off of that and had even some, um, some locals for you guys, the London police came and did some murals here in the alley as well. But everything from the mirrored piece that you see up top, which created this moment of reflection for light to bounce around. Um, and then there are also a lot of interactive pieces in the alley as well that you don't see necessarily pictured in here. So, everything that grabs your attention and makes you want to visit this place and makes you feel like you're inspired and, and uh, really created a um, sense of place for the dairy block itself. And then George Washington, how appropriate. Uh, this is a, <laughs> this is a um, Hilton in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and Martha, I know that this was one that you, um, Really, you handpicked some of these pieces. So if you wanted to chime in real quickly on your experience with this particular project, that would be great. Oh, sure. Well, I think it's very appropriate that we brought George, the slide of George Washington in for uh, our, our webinar with uh, our lovely team here of artists and developers in the UK. Uh, George was actually from Brooklyn, so that's why you'll see his portrait there, and he's kind of the guardian and the protector of this particular project, so just representing the American spirit. Thanks. And I think we may have another couple. Um, but I think this is our last one, and this this is actually a project that is in um, Seattle, Washington, and this is a multifamily project. And so what you can see really, just as a quick snapshot, I mean, we've really spanned everything from public placemaking, community building with um, events um, and temporary activations to multifamily right here, where this is actually um, a lovely apartment building. And this is, this is artwork done by uh, Jody Stewart. These are all done with 3D pens and installed along the hallway that connects one side of the apartment building amenity space to the other side. So something that people get to experience as they walk through. But rather than just having two-dimensional art everywhere, I think you guys can see from this uh, broad deck that uh, we work uh, across all different sectors and also all different media. 
great. Thanks very much. And, and if we could unshare the screen so I can see you, Molly. Um, I think when, when I was told about this topic of this panel, art in the public realm, I kind of naturally thought about outdoor spaces. But as your presentation shows, the public realm is also public buildings like hospitals and libraries and museums and things like that. Um, what is the difference in approach when you're commissioning art for an outdoor compared to an indoor space? <laughs> well, David touched on it earlier. Safety. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a huge I'm measuring one. The doors, I'm, making sure measuring the doors. <laughs> I'm dealing with that right now, actually, for an indoor piece. Um, so, no, that's a really great question. Uh, so, the, for the outdoor pieces, I mean, you have to deal with a whole different realm of uh, of city and um, community investors, right? So like you've got to get the whole community to buy into this. It's got to be safe. It's got to be, um, you know, something that people can maintain easily. You've got to deal with the elements. You've got to deal with engineering, wind loads. I mean, the, the amount of um, thought that goes into an outdoor piece and, the, and what you have to consider is very different from what goes into the interior public realm uh, for artwork. For instance, can it fit through the door? Do we need to install this piece? Right now I'm, I'm having to install a, a very expensive artwork that's gonna be hanging from a 20 foot ceiling in the um, lobby of a new apartment building. And we have to bring it in before the building is even close to being complete. Two years before the building is gonna be done because it's so heavy that we can't actually bring it into the space after the floors are put down because then if we roll over the floors, the floor tile could break. So that's the kind of pre-planning that you have to do for public art, interior and exterior, as really making sure that you think through every little moment of how you're gonna get from point A to point Z. Okay, thanks. And let's get on to the discussion now. I'm gonna ask a, a bunch of questions and I mean, please all feel, feel free to chip in, but otherwise I'll direct the questions to, to people. And the first question is like, why is public art important? Is it important? And why is it important? Can't we have public spaces without art? What's the problem with that? David, I think you should start <laughs> off with that one. Well, um, your livelihood depends on it. Yeah, my, my livelihood depends 50 on it. At least 50% of your out output. It's, well, it's not just my livelihood. It's actually my passion. And I don't know what I'd do. I wasn't doing this. Um, no, we absolutely have to have public pieces of art. I mean, throughout history, all different cultures from different millennia have all created pieces of public art, whether it's for, as religious symbols or statements or, or grandiose um, uh, gestures of their power and their, their, their wealth. But what we're doing now is we're seeing that the, the piece of art is, is, a, is a placemaker, it creates an identity and it is, it is about creating an identity for an area and it's um, ownership. For me, it's about the, the, the piece has to have the, the buy-in of the public. And as um, Morwenna was saying, it, it isn't about just having the piece as a statement in front of the office block. It's something that anyone passing by can appreciate and engage with and have a sense of ownership, intellectual, emotional, you know, ownership. So I feel very strongly that art in the public realm is, I mean, we, in a, in an extension of the question is, we are doing an enormous amount at the moment. People are becoming aware of the importance of outdoor public spaces and um, embellishing them with, uh, with pieces of art so that the, there is a, a, longer, a longer view on the, on the space. What about you, Morena? What's what's your what's your take on this? I mean, would it not be enough to just have open spaces with some trees in them? No, definitely not. I think there's two things. So starting with the sort of audience perspective, if you like, I think that that sense of ownership is really important. And I think ownership comes from having interactions and making memories. And I think actually one of the best ways to do that is around art and people having feelings and sensations associated. Um, with a place and it helps that connection. So it's really, um, really important for us um, to give those moments to people so that King's Cross starts to feel like theirs when it hasn't been really accessible in a safe um, way um, to people for, you know, uh, decades, if not a century or two. And then from a business perspective, 
I mean, there is an absolute business case for art uh, in the public realm. I mean, it generates audience, it generates footfall, and it broadens the sort of demographic of people who come and um, enjoy the space. And, you know, as I've said, we have a sort of um, a whole programme around arts, events and culture. And, and we do find basically for, for every pound we spend, we generate about 20 pounds of revenue. And for every pound we spend, we get about three more visitors. So there is a genuine um, business case for investing um, in art. So I was just trying to work out there. There's a, there's a, a better mental mathematician than me would be able to figure out what each of those three people spends to make that. Twenty pounds, six pounds sixty-six. Is it or something like that? Yeah, coffee, a coffee and a cake. <laughs> so, so basically, so what you're saying is that um, the putting in place some public arts. If you add up all the additional coffees that are spent because of that public art, it more than pays for the art in the first place. Yeah, and I, th I think for us, especially when we're looking at it as a sort of a, a piece of city, a whole postcode of city. For us, it's really important that actually people come and they stay and they dwell and they can make a whole day out of enjoying the space that we've created. And I think art and cultural events is a really important part of that because also you want people to be constantly coming back. You don't want them to come once and say, oh, great, you know, I've done that now. You know, I don't need to go again. And so actually what's worked really well for us in this sort of three nature of the works that we've done is that we draw people back time and time again and they create even more memories at King's Cross and, e and get an even stronger sense of um, ownership. And it's lovely when you're walking around and you, and you hear mem you know, people saying, you know, oh yeah, I, I brought you here because I wanted to show you this. And they feel like it's theirs. And it is theirs because it's, you know, in the space that they're, they're enjoying. And that's, you know, that makes us quite proud. Is that really the reason they come back there? Maybe they come back because the coffee was really good and they want the coffee again. <laughs> and, and they are, they didn't even notice it or it's just something nice to look at whilst they're sipping that coffee. No, I mean, we do, we do genuinely hear people talking about, about the art and those, and those experiences on top of the retail or, or the shopping or the food um, because those experiences are unique to that place. And that's, that's the thing about art. You know, you can go to restaurants and have a perfectly nice meal but you can replicate that somewhere else but actually with unique art you're generating a unique experience and um, that people you know hopefully won't forget well i've been playing devil's advocate with you because as someone who has a couple of not so young children anymore but we made multiple trips to granary square for them to play <laughs> in the fountain so i know yeah. <laughs> i know it makes sense what you're saying and um uh, Martha and Molly, same question to you, like, really? Public art, is it really that important? If one of your clients has $200,000, should it really go on art? Could it not go on, I don't know, some trampolines or um, a, a cafe or a bit more car parking? Why does it, why should, <laughs> why, is, why is public art so important? Well, I like the idea, maybe the trampolines could be the art. Uh, you know, if you're in, in Copenhagen, they have the, the tramps kind of built into the sidewalk so you can walk along and then bounce from one to next. So, I, you know, I think, I think it's, it's all kind of part of that, as Morena was saying, that entire experience. You know, you might have a great coffee and a cake, but then you have this unique memory of something and maybe you recognize it or maybe it's in your subconscious. But art as David mentioned earlier, it really tells the story of humanity. And all of our great cultures are represented by something iconic that we think of. I mean, the art creates a sense of arrival and destination. So, you know, I mean, when, when you go to Italy, you might want to see the David. This is just kind of this iconic presence of, of what the place is. It's a masterwork. Uh, you know, we have the Statue of Liberty that marks your entry when you're coming over across the Atlantic to the U.S., it marks that you've arrived. And in, back to, to Copenhagen, you know, even the Little Mermaid, as subtle and, and beautiful as that small uh, work representing the work of Hans Christian Andersen, I think we are using art as a way to tell the stories of what our civilization brings to the world and, and what our creative, creativity means to us as a culture. And so not only is it important to bring inspiration for our entire community, but you know, it, it's also, it's good business. 
having a great art program is good business because it drives a memory of a place that you want to visit time and time again. I'll we just add on. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Molly. I was just going to say, I, I completely agree with everything that everyone has said so far. And I think that everyone's done such a nice job summarizing it. And I would just add one more thing, which is that that memory can become so powerful because I think of, um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Lucifer, our, what some people refer to as our demon horse here at the airport when you fly in. This, giant monstrous piece of public artwork that is a huge blue mustang with bright red eyes and it is one of the most controversial pieces that is talked about constantly it has been here for 10 years and people still talk about it on a daily basis and so it creates conversation whether it's a conversation that's positive or negative for the art people are talking about it and it's getting attention. And so I think that it's important to remember too that art sparks these conversations um, and that's critical to community building. Well, that neatly leads on to my, my next question, which is about, you know, art can spark conversations and art, art can inspire people, but art can often be controversial and it can often be difficult as well. So the, the question is, how important is it that people who see the art get the art how important is, is the nice is the art like a, a pacifier that makes people think oh that's very nice isn't it or is it is it risky to challenge people with difficult ideas i mean david for you is it is it important that someone who looks at one of your pieces understands your anti artistic ambition with that piece or is it okay for you if they just think oh that's pretty it's it's sort of okay if they think it's pretty because everyone everyone um, appreciates things in a different way. Um, I'd like them to perhaps question what I was trying to achieve, but, but it's more about the piece um, giving somebody a bit of respite in the crazy, busy, hectic world. The piece, if it's, if it's aesthetically well created or whether it's been beautifully engineered or whether it, it is telling them it's creating uh, a story that they wouldn't have otherwise uh, alighted upon. Um, it's, it's definitely about trying to give somebody a moment of distraction. Um, and uh, uh, the, the urban world that we live in is very busy, it's very commercial, it's very frantic. And to have something there that is, a, that is not there for obvious purposes of trying to extract money from you or engage you in something, I think is really wonderful. And that's particularly with art, it's it's um it is something that, that that has to be appreciated or engaged with to to have its function that's not i'm not explaining that very well but i do i i don't mind if people don't understand what i'm trying to do but as long as they feel that this has been placed here with the best of intentions for them to enjoy if they choose to thanks and Morwenna, how about you i mean if you think about uh, another public art project in London, like the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square, for example, it's almost like the point of that sometimes seems to be to provoke people, to put things in front of people that they're not comfortable with, to challenge them on what they consider to be art. Would you do something like that in, um, in King's Cross or, or does the art there have a different purpose to, you know, to calm people down, almost to encourage them to spend money? Is it, does it have a, a different intention from pure art that you might see in a gallery? Um, I think potentially different to, to what you, what you, how you've just described. I think, um, I think it's important to us that, you know, people talk and discuss, uh, we acknowledge that not everyone will like all the pieces of, of art. Um, we're very fortunate in that with a broad, um, kind of site, there are many different kind of different types of installations that we can, we can do. Um, we do, I think, feel that we need to provide some leadership. Um, you can't necessarily be all things to all people, um, but that's why we work very closely with curators and we, we put arts panels together to help us because we're not, um, you know, sort of able to, to make all of that, those decisions ourselves. Um, but we do want people to feel like they can engage um, with the artwork. And I think there is more that we can do around that to help tell the story of the artwork. Um, and we're looking at that in terms of um, a sort of digital 
um, sort of support so that people can sort of see and understand the, the backstory and, and reflect a bit longer on the art pieces. Um, so it is, it is something that we are um, constantly thinking about, about how do we in, sort of intensify the engagement that people can get um, from the artwork. I think the other thing that's important to say is that um, what we also try and do is get a, a, a broad spectrum of artists because actually what we can't do is determine what, what people should be liking or not liking. But what we can do is walk, work with a broad set of artists who you know, will come up with a, a very wide set selection of ideas that will then appeal to as broad an audience as possible. And I mean, with a, with a shopping proposition, obviously shops open, if they do well, they stay open. If they don't do so well, they close down and another shop might take that space. What about art? What if what if one of the sculptures doesn't get as many people taking Instagram pictures of it as another piece of art? Would you then switch that out for another one, or or do you accept that things are going to get different reactions? From different yeah, people? we accept uh, that, and especially you know we were just talking about works in in the public realm. I think actually sometimes one of the sad things about works in the public realm is they don't always last forever. And actually, we've got a couple of artworks at the moment that are coming to their end of end of their lives and getting towards the commissioning um, period, and that's really sad. I think we all do get quite emotionally connected with the artworks, no matter the level of sort of social media su uh, success they've had. But I think that's an important thing about a sort of collection, which is, you know, where we're uh, working towards is um, that there should be a variety of pieces doing a variety of different um, things for lots of different people. And so inevitably there will be one or two pieces which, you know, aren't measured as um, successful um, by social media. Potentially. Oh, also, if they start to fall apart, is that <laughs> unexpected that they're reaching the end of their lives or something that? Well, because only because we've, um, yeah, as I said before, we've been we've been commissioning to date more temporary pieces of work as um, the site has been evolving, um, because we've been putting them on places that, for example, you know, two years later we're actually going to be building building on, and um, so some of the design lives haven't been that long. But the pieces that have been a massive success, what the challenge to us now is actually how do we potentially convert this into more of a, a permanent um, sort of landmark? Um, because it's, it's, you know, becoming very well known and, and loved in the area. And Martha and Molly, same question to you, but with a slight spin on it, you work with all different types of clients, both public and private. So this idea of, you know, art sometimes being risky, art sometimes being challenging, how important is it to you and your clients that the average person who sees the artwork gets it and do you sort of have a sliding scale of risk that you offer different clients according to how challenging the art might be or how accepting the audiences might be? Mm -hmm. Yeah I think um, that's that's a good question because we like to dep it depends on the space number one I mean a hospital for instance we don't need to make people feel uncomfortable. The whole point, right, is to make people sort of distracted from whatever they're going through at the time. So we don't really need to be challenging any of their norms. <laughs> We're trying to make them feel more comfortable and more at home. Um, but in, in, a, in a, some of the other realms that we work within, such as public sector, um, multifamily, specifically in hospitality, um, there is a, definitely more risk that our clients tend to want to take in those areas um, because they want people to have memories. Again, they want people to um, connect to the space. And that may not necessarily be a connection of, oh, wow, that's really pretty. It might be a connection of what is that? But that gets them thinking, which then creates a memory of thinking about something cool in that space. Um, and we always do like to push our clients into a risk zone and see how far they want to go. So that we're, we know that we're trying to take it a little further every time with each project. And then if they're uncomfortable, we can always pull it back. But Martha, do you want to add on to that as well? Well, I was going to share our, our rule of thirds. So when we're putting together a collection for you know, a large scale site, you want people to have different types of experiences in different places. So we tend to focus on saying, okay, one third of the works might be uh, loved. One third of the works perhaps might be somewhat ambivalent and one third people really might not like. 
And the thirds are going to be different for every person who comes through. And normally we end up with a much broader spectrum of things that people actually love, but we try to prepare the, the clients that we're working with that you don't have to love every single thing because the thing you love is going to be the one that someone else perhaps isn't as attracted to. And when you're looking at one work of art specifically and how it appeals, you want to think about the different levels and the different ways that the audience is going to interact with it. And a great work of art has three characteristics. This is a, a lecture by Shea Ombre, and I love the way he put this. Every great work of art should appeal to the head, the hand, and the heart. So a great work of art should appeal in the level of thought. What was the idea behind creating it? What was the inspiration? And some people will appeal to just the idea. They will resonate with that idea and that will become meaningful. A great work of art should also show the artist's hand, their craftsmanship, their work in creatively making this thing out of nothing. That is the work of an artist. And sometimes people simply are just attracted to the labor that went into making this thing and making this idea that no one else had. And then finally, the heart, which is appear appealing on an emotional level and creating a feeling. And so for some people, a work of art can, can bring feelings of joy, delight, even reflection or sadness. And all of those things are, are part of experiencing a really powerful work of art. Is there, is there such a thing as trends in public art? Are, are you seeing um, a, a move towards bigger art or shinier art or more sustainable art? Is, is, is there like a kind of movement in the way things are going? David, it, it, are you getting calls for more round things, for example, or is, it, no, we, do you, are you able to, are you freely able to create whatever you want or do people steer you in a direction according to what other people are doing? I've spent 30 years making round things and I started <laughs> making perfect armillary spheres, circles. Um, a lot of the things we do are round, but that's not, not to say that we don't try and branch out from that. The, um, I think people look at what we do and they may be attracted by some of the shapes and the forms and the, the methods of fabrication. But actually, we're constantly, to keep ourselves entertained, we're constantly coming up with new shapes, new forms, new, new methods. And it's, it's, we, I enjoy being challenged. So, but in terms of a trend, there isn't, you know, we are seeing more larger public pieces that, that there was a phase of, of shiny mirror polished stainless steel, which requires a, a, a decent amount of maintenance if it's in a public place, because it can be scratched and damaged. Um, I think the, the cloud in um, Chicago is an example of that. It needs repolishing on a very frequent basis, just through public interaction. Uh, it's an iconic and amazing piece, and it was a splendid investment, even if it was slightly over budget. So our, my take on that at the moment is, we get asked to do things, and it, the more we're pushed outside our comfort zone, the, the better. We, we, we sort of strive to create new pieces. Some of the, the pieces, in fact, we created for Denver was a new piece and very exciting, and quite difficult. Um, I don't see a trend, I'm afraid. Um, I'm, I do see that there are, there's a, there's a demand for pieces of art to just to be um, in, pub, in the public realm, in parks and public places. We're getting quite a lot of demand for that at the moment. And it's really about the, the awareness that the, the public space is incredibly important. We don't have a reputation for making confrontational or uh, intellectually demanding pieces. Uh, we, I hope that there is an aesthetic there which is um, relaxing and the qualities the, of the material and the fabrication that tells the story. It's, it's not really about, um, it's about intriguing, engaging, educating, and hopefully pleasing the eye. But I'm not, I haven't yet ever set out to um, offend, shock, or, or um, uh, upset anyone. What about you, Morwenna? I mean, I, I, we, we touched on this at the beginning of the talk. There is 
there's definitely a trend for the public realm being taken more seriously and, and mm -hmm. developers realizing that if you invest in um, beautiful public spaces, which it, per square foot might not generate income in their own right, but they lend kudos to an area, they bring people mm -hmm. in, they make people think about them in a different way. But what about the pieces of art you place throughout that? Is there a kind of, is there a, like a, a 2020s thing going on? I mean, a lot of the pieces that you commission are, are sort of um, like site specific in some way, but you're not commissioning figurative statues, are you? No, I think, I think um, quite a lot of the artwork has been more sort of interactive and physically engaging. Um, where you can actually, you know, touch and interact with the art and make things happen. I think that's, you know, particularly um, good for our sort of target. You know, we want families and, and you know, children as well to enjoy um, the space and enjoy the art. But you're right, there is, I think the, the key trend is how seriously people are taking it. You know, we've, we've, been doing this for quite a number of years and 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 there are lots of developers who are doing the same now um you know Quintain hiring a cultural director and Night Dragon setting out design districts and things I think especially in London I think it's a great trend uh, it's certainly a trend that's keeping us on our toes and um, which is that more and more um developers are investing in the public investing in art and um would you ever commission a like a figurative statue or is there i mean the, the big story in terms of public art in the last few months has been the tearing down of, of statues that mm -hmm. were erected in the past to people who who now seen in a, in a different way is that is that ever going to come back do you think is that um i think what's really interesting actually is the sort of um celebrating the everyday hero and also celebrating um people that have been overlooked for decades um actually the sort of recent sculpture in stratford of a a young black woman on her mobile phone, for example, I think that's an indication of, um, you know, how we can celebrate a wider, um, you know, variety and of people. And I think those sorts of um, public art we will probably see more of, hopefully, in the next sort of 10 to 20 years. And Martha and Molly, same question to you, but, but again, with a, with a spin on it, I mean, you must be all the time having conversations with, with clients, all the time having conversations with artists, it is, do you feel like you're part of um, the culture of driving art forward? It is, is there a kind of, do you see types of public art that, that, that weren't there before cropping up and then you recommend them to clients? How, do, how does that all work? Do, do your clients want to be leaders and being the first person to get a certain artist or a certain type of artwork or do they tend to want to sort of more follow what other places are doing? Well, you know, it depends on the client. I think when you look at places like King's Cross, you know, they're trying to attract a broad swath of the population and bring in a number of different people. And when you work, look at David's work, you know, it appeals to a wide audience. And their children, adults, everyone really has the opportunity to participate. So what we see is a really uh, high demand for artwork that's engaging, uh, that you can, you know, play with or be a part of in the age of COVID, maybe not touching as much, but that you can at least interact with in some way. And it, it's interesting to see what happens when you have the vision of a developer and a curator and an artist and how that can really come to life in a creative way. And also what happens when uh, a committee might go out to the public, for example, and just get you know a dozen people from uh, the general community to vote on what kind of artwork should be installed. That is something that happens here in, in the US with our public art panels and some of the larger cities. Anytime there's government funding, sometimes there's private funding, in which case the artist generally has a bit more creativity. When there's public or government funding for artwork, it goes out to a large panel. And anytime there's a large panel involved, if there is something that is large, red, and an animal, every time it's going to win <laughs> the I'm, proposal I'm because doing it. <laughs> people yes big big red things big red animals are just it's very very hard for anyone to say no and now in our public art collection here in denver we have this we do we have a collection of big red sculptures we have a collection of some big blue animals 
Uh, we've got a big blue bear, a big blue horse, uh, and then a giant red person at the train station. So, you know, it, it's kind of funny, but people do tend to sort of gravitate uh, to certain trends. Yeah, David, you're missing a trick. Big red animals. No, I've, I've, I've already sent a message. We're going to start with <laughs> scrap all the shiny stainless steel. It's big red animals. From now on. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anything to add to that, Molly? <laughs> no. Uh, well, yes. Apart from wanna... explaining why big red animals are so popular. I, I don't know why, but it's, it is an amazing trend. And I just saw it come up again recently, the, just big and red. And I had to tell my client, I just want to give you a heads up that you are following the trend. And he immediately said, I don't want to. Let's change it. We're changing the color. I said, all right, let's change the color. So, um. So I think so that's something that so we do. It's a blue animal then instead, is it? Yeah, no, we went from uh, no <laughs> animals and we changed it to white. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's interesting. There are always going to be trends, and um, I am constantly reminding um, my uh, our clients of certain things that are very tr on trend at the time to l let them know, hey, we can do this for you. But just as an FYI, I've seen this in ten other projects across the United States. Do you want to follow that trend still, or do you want to be the trendsetter? And almost every time the client says, we don't want to do that. We want to do our own thing. So I think that that is um, really positive for us, but also for artists out there um, that, you know, we can tap into emerging talent. We can help build artists' careers. Um, we've had several clients who they have purchased things um, from artists that have never done anything um, at the size or scale that, that, these, that we've commissioned them to do. And now these artists are full-time artists and they've blossomed into these amazing career artists. And so giving those opportunities to a multitude of people rather than just this top echelon of artists that everybody maybe is familiar with or says, oh, I want that too. So introducing new artists and new um, ideas is really critical to, to, to making places unique too. If we all have a cloud in our city, then why is it special anymore to Chicago? Why do you need to go visit it when you're there? So I think that um, pushing those boundaries and making sure that we're constantly looking for the new next thing is really important. Well, speaking of Anish Kapoor, we have a, a very large Anish Kapoor piece in Stratford in London. And I mean, if any other city in the world is interested in taking it, I would really love for you to take it off our hands. Any offers? Is it red? Um, <laughs> it is, it red. is already red. It's red, yeah. And it could loosely describe, be described as an animal or more precisely a beast. We're, we're really out of time here. I, we have a, a question, time for one question from anonymous attendee who's then put his name at the end, Roy Hogburn. <laughs> uh, is there a persuasive expert financial argument that can be used to help convince um, potential clients that there's an actual financial return on the investment in public art? So that's an interesting question. Like, can you prove that public art generates a return? But I would like to add into that, why is it important that it has a financial return? Should art be a, something that, that makes money for a space? Martha, you're up on my screen, screen nodding your head there, so it seems like you want to take that one. Well, I, I'll, I'll try to answer both of those. So uh, we recently had a study published in the U.S. by the Urban Land Institute. I know you have a, a European uh, group that does this as well, but our Urban Land Institute in the U.S. Uh, surveyed all of its members who are real estate developers and real estate investors, and 91% of them agreed that art and culture add value to real estate projects. So that's an important statistic in that that's a generally accepted guiding principle in the real estate industry. And if you know, the person you're talking to isn't up to speed, then you can simply share with them some of their own industry reports. Now, that's a question that you have to answer. But I think the bigger and, and the more enlightened question is why is that even a question, right? Do you think about what's, what's the value of having a great architect? What's the value of having a, you know, a great attorney? They bring, they bring value beyond themselves because it's, it's the thought and the creativity of their expression and the way that they solve problems. That's what you're hiring for. 
So I, I think it's, it's hard to put a number on it, but if you need numbers, they do exist. Anyone else want to chip in there? Is there an equation that can justify uh, um, expenditure? All I can health? say is I, I hope there isn't an equation because it will, <laughs> it will destroy creativity and it will, it will send us in the wrong direction. I mean, the, the, the act of creating something uh, for other people to enjoy should be the, um, the premise. Um, we hope it benefits the bigger picture, but I, um, uh, I'm sure someone somewhere can number crunch it and prove a point. And, um, but uh, it would be sad if that became the, from, from my point of view, it'd be very sad if that was the, the, mo the motivation. What about you, Moen? Obviously you get a budget for your art commissions, but you then have to go back and show that you've generated a return on that, on that installation? No, uh, we, we don't look at it uh, installation by installation. I think that would be non impossible anyway. I think, um, I think it is obviously very important to us that people enjoy coming um, to our places, you know, want to buy uh, our apartments, want to shop in the shops, etc. cetera. Um, and as I've said before, it is really a layered approach and, and art is a really important part um, of making our places successful. Um, but we don't look at it in a sort of a, on a standalone uh, basis. Okay, we're out of time, I'm afraid, everybody. I just want to read out a nice comment that's come in from Victoria Panda. This is a really ter terrific discussion. It's wonderful hearing all these insights and concepts. Thanks so much for holding this webinar. Um, um, it leaves it up to me now to do the thing I always hate doing the most, which is summarize in terms of some <laughs> takeaways. Um, but I think we've heard that that public art, that art in, in, in the public realm is important for place making, for identity, for giving local or users of that space a sense of ownership. It can create a sense of arrival, can create a sense of destination. Um, crucially, it can add value. We've, we've, talk, we've heard different um, responses to the kind of financial reasons why you want, might want to invest in, in public art, in uh, art in public spaces. Um, there's definitely uh, a sense that you shouldn't follow trends and that you should be brave, but failing that, big red animals would seem to be the way to go. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Thanks okay, so much, so David. Once again, thank you. I'm just going to just going to sign off. So to end, I'd like to say a huge thanks to the panel. That's great. From I know you've got you're very busy in America at the moment, um, and thank you to Marcus for so diligently steering us through that little uh, that hour. Um, and to the audience for giving up their time and listening and engaging. If anyone wants to catch up with any of the previous ones, just search for David Harbour on YouTube. In the meantime, if you want to find out any more about, um, well, I guess me, it's David Harbour Sculptures, uh, David, media, social media on David Harbour, Scu uh, David Harbour Sculptures. And um, wherever you are, stay creative, stay well, and um, have, a good, uh, have a good week. Thank you very much. All done. Thank you. Bye-bye.